oftentimes uh, we are told not to eat saturated fats because saturated fats raise our cholesterol and it's so bad for us. And therefore we should be eating like the canola oils and the seed oils. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, absolutely. I mean, first of all, that's just madness. I mean, there's no good evidence that shows that we should be having seed oils. Uh, I guess part of the, the myth of how this got established is through an irrational fear of saturated fat. We've basically been sold a lie. We've been told that saturated fats are going to kill us, when in actual fact, all the good quality evidence shows the exact opposite. And not only that, that the good quality evidence, the findings have actually been, I, I guess, swept under the carpet. They've been deliberately kept out of public view, including from scientists and medical doctors. So if we go back, there was a, I won't talk too long on this because I have talked extensively about them before, but there was two studies in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, the Sydney Diet Heart Study and the Minnesota Coronary Experiment. And they were both randomised controlled trials that looked at what happened when you removed saturated fat from the diet mm -hmm. and replaced it with vegetable oils, seed oils. And what they both found was that cholesterol would go down, but mortality rates would increase. And unfortunately, while these studies were completed in 1973, the findings actually weren't published until 2013 and 2016, respectively. So, I mean, they, they were completely swept under the carpet. This is an absolute, um, it should be a widespread scandal. Um, and when the investigators in one of the studies were asked why they didn't publish their results, they actually said, well, we didn't get the results we wanted. They actually deliberately, they, they didn't get the results that would support their hypothesis that they personally believed in. So they swept it under the carpet. And this is still happening today. We've got the $700 million publicly funded Women's Health Initiative study. And that has actually found real harms for people going on low saturated fat diets. They found that there's, you know, increased problems, medical problems, cardiac disease, heart attacks, when people remove the saturated fat from their diet, and they've done their very best to obscure these findings and prevent them from ever seeing the light of day. So it's an absolute scandal. And I guess reflecting on this, the reason that we're scared of saturated fat is we're told that it will increase our LDL cholesterol level. And that's actually wrong on two levels. First of all, the best data we have shows that people with higher LDL levels live longer. Mm -hmm. On average, higher LDL level confers longevity. And number two, which is absolutely fascinating, is that there is no known mechanism by which saturated fats actually increase LDL cholesterol. Rather, there's known mechanisms by which seed oils reduce LDL cholesterol because they, they have these uh, chemicals called sterols. They're plant chemicals, phytochemicals, plant sterols, that our body will absorb thinking that it's, it can use it, but it can't actually assimilate it into the body, so it forces our cholesterol levels to lower. So when we talk about saturated fats increasing cholesterol levels, they're not increasing cholesterol levels physiologically they're merely restoring them to a level it's actually vegetable oils and seed oils and they're one and the same that artificially lower our cholesterol levels and that's something really important so if uh, any of your listeners out there and they get into an argument with a or a discussion a debate with anybody about saturated fats ask them what the mechanism is by which saturated fats actually increase LDL levels. It'll be a, a, an interesting response. In terms of the seed oils, why are we recommending? I mean, one, I guess it's because we fear LDL and so it lowers it, but we also fear just lots of banter lately about polyunsaturated fatty acids being harmful. Is that one of the reasons why seed oils are less than ideal to be consuming? Great question, because uh, this is a huge misunderstanding in the low-carb, carnivore, ketogenic space. There's this belief that omega-6 fats, mm -hmm. which form the bulk of the, the oil, the fats in seed oils, are inherently harmful. Right. 
Right. And that is demonstrably false. So allow me to explain. So we've got two types of polyunsaturated fat. So a polyunsaturated fat simply refers to having a double bond between two carbon atoms. And that double bond is chemically reactive. It can do what we call oxidize. And that oxidation um, can actually be absorbed into our body and can do us damage. Poly meaning many. So polyunsaturated fats have more than one of these double bonds. Monounsaturated fats like olive oil, which is constituted of 70% oleic acid, has only a single double bond and saturated fats don't have any of these double bonds. So what actually happens is that when we consume a seed oil, a vegetable oil, we're consuming fats which are prone to oxidation and the oxidation is actually what's doing the damage. It just so happens that most seed oils are actually uh, purport, disproportionately made of omega-6 fats but it's not the omega-6 fats themselves that do the damage it's the fact that whenever you have a, uh, a polyunsaturated fat it oxidizes rapidly within hours of production literally within hours wow. and when you're consuming it you're consuming that oxidation that's the bad news there now the way to think about it is have you ever heard of arachidonic acid yes in school a little bit so arachidonic acid is a, uh, a chemical that's formed from the omega-6s mm. and it can get turned into multiple other inflammatory uh, chemicals. So what this actually means is that uh, we've, we've assumed that arachidonic acid can turn into leukotrienes, it can turn into thromboxane A2 and so on and so forth, prostaglandins, it must be bad for us. But in actual fact, the arachidonic acid is not inflammatory. It will only turn into these inflammatory substrates if there's an inflammatory trigger. If you remove inflammatory triggers, that arachidonic acid will sit there quite happily and won't do anything bad at all. Now, for proof of this, we go to one of the doyens of low carb, Jeff Volick. He was involved in a study that was published in 2019. And that looked at the fatty acid profiles in people who went on a low carbohydrate intervention versus people on high carbohydrate diets. And what they actually found was that the arachidonic acid level in the people on low carbohydrate diets increased. And this is hugely important to understand because every other inflammatory marker reduced. So it really goes to show that the reason the arachidonic acid was increasing was simply because it wasn't, you removed the inflammatory triggers and it wasn't being converted into these other downstream products that generate, cause inflammation that are associated with inflammation. The way to think about it is that omega-6 is an essential fatty acid. We need it for life. Without it, we die. The problem is that when we consume it from seed and vegetable oils, we consume it in an oxidized form. The best way to actually get it is from fresh food. So meat, so grass-fed meat has got both omega-3 and omega-6. And if the omega-6 or any of the polyunsaturated fats in that meat becomes oxidised, that meat would be rancid. And we don't eat rancid meat. We don't have rotten food. So if you're getting your omega-6s and omega-3s from natural food, then it's very unlikely to be oxidised. So that's a perfectly healthy way to get it. So fresh fish, don't have rotten fish. It, it's really it's really quite obvious. Whereas if you're having it in a bottle, that bottle's, you know, that's been sitting there for who knows how long. When I learned about the different seed oils in nutritional therapy school, I looked into how canola oils were made and they were heated I think six to seven times. And there's a certain threshold that they say that once that heat is past that amount, then it will get oxidized. But the way that they produce these canola oils specifically, the, the range was much higher than that threshold. And so I knew from school, um, these oils are not ideal because of the oxidation. And then also some of the sprays that they use on these plants. 
but it wasn't so much about the omega-6. Sure, we should eat more natural meats. And then, but in this community, we get scared not about the oxidation necessarily, but because of the omega-6 level. So it's really interesting that you're bringing this up. So you mentioned canola oil. So it's interesting that you bring that up because that's actually the one vegetable oil or seed oil, it's really a seed oil, right. that actually has a reasonable amount of omega-3s in it, right. um, a two to one ratio. And when you look at the data, canola oil is really no healthier than any other mm -hmm. seed oil. So it really speaks to the point, it's not the omega-6s and 3 ratio, it's the fact that you're consuming oxidized products. And this is why, because most oils, however, are highly, highly, they have a uh, bias towards having far more omega-6s, that when we look at something called the fatty acid omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in your red blood cells, that people with a very high ratio are actually usually in far worse health. Mm. And that's simply because this ratio is a surrogate marker for mm. seed oil consumption because most of the sixes that we have in our diet is from seed oils. So when you consume an oil, you actually absorb the oxidation products and those oxidation products get assimilated into the body. It right. can contribute to oxidized LDL, which we know is bad. And it's actually been shown to lead to fatty liver disease. We've got very good electron microscopy studies that show when you deliver oxidation stress to uh, mouse livers that you generate um, basically fatty liver. Uh, we've also got very good studies that show if you want to exacerbate that oxidation load from an oil, the best way to do so is with what we call glycemic instability. Basically, have your sugar levels go up and down. In this regard, they've actually done studies where they've actually looked at what we call um, the oxidative stress that's delivered to endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessels. And they've found that fluctuations in blood glucose level are far more problematic than... Uh, persistently elevated but flat levels of blood glucose and they did a really nice study this was uh but what they did they fed people oxidized oils and they had them stratified into three groups some of them were healthy no blood glucose problems at all then they had well controlled diabetics and then they had poorly controlled diabetics and what they actually found was that in the non-diabetics and the well-controlled diabetics that they could measure the oxidation entering the circulation and remaining in place for eight hours after consuming the food. Wow. However, in the people with poorly controlled diabetes, so they're having fluctuating blood sugar levels, and remember this is associated with extra oxidative stress, they found an increase in blood oxidation persisting for eight, uh, three days, 72 hours. So compare that, eight hours versus 72 hours. Right. And that only difference, they were having the same oxidation load in terms of oil, but they were having far, you know, the, the blood sugar control was far, far worse. And there's this nexus between seed oils and diabetes and poor sugar control that a lot of people don't understand. So not only does the, uh, the diabetes make the oxidation damage from seed oils worse, but consuming the oxidation products makes your blood sugar level worse. It ends up in this little cycle. Right. So they did this lovely study back in 1965. It was the Rose Corn Oil Study. And that was uh, probably the first randomised controlled trial that actually showed harm from uh, vegetable and seed oils. They basically had a couple of different groups. They had an olive oil group. They had a corn oil group, which is a seed oil. And they had a saturated fat group. Uh, in the uh, saturated fat group over the duration of the study, it went for two years, there was one death. And in the corn oil group, they had five deaths. So uh, the conclusion of the authors was that, you know, seed oils are really shouldn't be used, they shouldn't be recommended. And as you can predict, those findings were routinely ignored. But the really interesting findings from this study happens with when they discuss what happened to the individual participants. And they describe one case in particular who actually developed diabetes when he went on the corn oil and then they stopped giving the subject corn oil, the diabetes disappeared. And they, they did this, uh, you know, no intervention, intervention. And they found that whenever they gave the subject the corn oil, his diabetes returned. 
And the way they were measuring it was with glucose in the urine. So when your blood glucose levels go extremely high, the kidneys can no longer hold all the sugar in your body and some excess sugar leaks into the urine. So glucose in the urine, and it's thought to probably be about 14 or 15 millimoles a litre in the blood that will lead to what we call this renal overflow. And what they actually, you know, this is very good evidence of extremely poorly controlled diabetes. So these case studies are very strong indicators that you can basically lead to somebody meeting the diagnostic criteria for diabetes by giving them seed oil and then reverse that by removing the seed oil. Right. So very, very strong links between uh, seed oils and diabetes. 